let's do a number of little jobs this week. It's time to assemble a Strat from disparate parts of numerous manufacturers. What could go wrong? Oh no, let's be optimistic. You guys know I usually turn down any opportunity to assemble kit guitars for people and like parts casters. My skills are needed elsewhere. I think of that as it's work for the hobbyist. It could be fun for someone in many cases, but usually they're trying to call me in for damage control after they've made some huge mistakes. You know, I want to work on things that have been broken rather than stuff that's ill-conceived from the get-go, you know? This is for a customer for whom I've done a bunch of work. He just had eye surgery. He can't do it for himself. He said, please. I said, meh. He said, come on. I said, meh. This is a Fender product. He likes the late 60s swoopy doopy headstock, so he bought himself a squire neck, put it on, and discovered that the fit is not fantastic. So he wants me to shim it. I'll color the shim white. He's got a flashy perloid pick guard. He wants a humbucker. Uh, he's got some new pickups, some metallic covers and um, better tuning machines. Lots of fun parts. Here's the thing. I can tell right now that this stuff, being from any number of sources, is not going to fit together first try. It's always, you can just throw it together for me, right? It's, no, almost never. If every part requires some finesse to get it to fit, you're talking hours upon hours. And unless you have substantial experience, you're going to learn that though cosmetically similar, some parts just don't fit together. You could be mixing metric and imperial measurements, squire versus American standard dimensions, uh, placement of screw holes, vintage American versus modern American placement. On an inexpensive instrument, it gets maddening. We'll see what happens. Okay, before I dig in too deep, I want to get a basic assessment here to see where we're starting off. Checking the action. It's around 7 64ths. Neck relief is a bit high at 17 thousandths. String clearance over the first fret is like 27 thousandths on the base side, which is quite high. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is straighten the neck a bit. Let's see what that did. Yeah, it's around 7 thousandths now, which is good. And now we're down around just over 5 64ths on the bass and 6 on the treble. I'm just going to take care of the nut height as well. So now the action height's okay. I lowered the saddles down to where I would want the action to be on the outside E strings here, and you can see that they're pretty much on the deck. There's a lot of screw protruding out the top. And frankly, it's just, it looks kind of weird. So it definitely needs a shim to increase the neck angle. The thing with shimming a neck pocket laterally is you have to concern yourself with where the strings are going to end up in relation to the pickup pull pieces when you're done. And to be honest, where this is now is not bad at all, actually. Um, it's not perfect on any pickup, but it's kind of what you would expect to see in a guitar in this range. Uh, I really don't want to push it that much towards the treble side, I don't think, so I might end up just leaving it where it is and simply filling this little gap on this side. Actually, let me load the new pick guard first and see what the new pickups are like before we get into that. We'll save that for later. Next Frugal Pro tip. I'm going to take the strings off here, but I'm just going to clip off the weird ends um, because I can save these and reuse them for the setup portion of this whole thing. Uh, because I'm likely going to have the strings on and off a number of times, and that way I'm not spending extra money for another set of strings, which I'm just going to have to throw out. And once again, we're in the situation where, though the cover has holes in it to put the strings through, ostensibly, you can't get the strings through it, so you have to remove the cover. I'm just going to disconnect the jack to start off with here. This has a fully shielded cavity. That's interesting. The grounding wire to the trem has been 
soldered or soldered directly to the claw and through the end of the spring, which is probably not the best idea, I don't think. I'm going to do a little work on this mandolin. This is a Trinity College model from the good people at the Saga Musical Instrument Corporation, a venerable firm that makes millions of instruments. Um, this has got a couple of little issues, and it's a lefty, as you can see. I must remember to put this strap back on before restringing it, because it's one of these where it would be really annoying if I didn't. This is kind of an interesting design. It's not very Gibson-like at all. The top has a curve to it, which I don't know whether that was carved or whether it was radiused by pressing into a form of some kind. The sides don't have the undulation you would normally see if this was, you know, sanded in a radius dish. Um, pretty robust top. And the back is flat. And when I say flat, I mean really flat. There's no arch in that at all. Which is interesting. Very few makers would do that. The issue is there's a crack that runs through the top at the end of the fingerboard, and what also seems to go through the support that was placed under it. Now, the customer figures this may have been glued once before, so we're going to see what's actually going on in there. This instrument was converted for left-handed use, and as such it has no side dot markers on the fingerboard. We'll put some of those in for him as well. Upon inspection we see that there's one diagonal crack through the soundboard and it carries on through the support plate which surrounds the sound hole. There's also a remnant of tape there on the end of the brace which I don't know what that's about. Perhaps left over from a previous repair? This leads me to think that the best adhesive for this is probably thin super glue. You know, this is the shape the soundboard wants to be, and I can be sure that it will get drawn deep into that crack. Uh, afterwards, I'll make up a thin support cleat to put under here for added insurance. I'm following the pattern on the fingerboard. For some reason, mandolins have their marker here at the 10th fret rather than the 9th, which you find on guitars. Some people are very particular about that. The lacquer on this is probably some kind of catalyzed urethane. It's very chippy. Um, in other words, it wants to kind of delaminate from the rosewood underneath pretty quickly, so to be kind of careful. You see what I mean about the delamination? As soon as you break through the surface, you end up with this ghostly white mark around it. It's actually an air bubble. So, when I hit this with some super glue, that will hopefully get filled and turn clear again. You just have to be very careful because it's fragile like this. You know, it would be easy to knock that piece off. I'm using thin super glue in this case to both glue the dot in and try to consolidate that finish. After which I'll pare off the excess, I'll sand it and polish it, make it look shiny. I think that's an acceptable result. So the crack does actually go up through the top here. I'm just squeezing some glue through with my finger. Just removing this piece of tape. Yeah, I've got this tipped in such a way that the glue is not going to run all over the surface, but capillary action will draw it down throughout the crack. The sad thing is it's going to become more apparent as it's wet with the glue, but maybe we can sand that a bit as well, get some dust in there, and take care of that dark line. I've planed some material for a little cleat. I'll just scribe around the outline there and cut it to shape, 
glued it in place. And here I'm just um, adding some shellac to the end of the fingerboard here to seal up the work after sanding. <laughs> I didn't forget. What a great tailpiece. If anyone knows where to get one of these, to buy them commercially, let me know, because I want one. You know, sometimes I can fake it on mandolin, but with it upside down, get ready for some atonal droning. This is a nice big heavy brass inertia block for the trem. To get it on there, I'm probably going to have to remove all the saddles to access the screws. Yeah, probably. Here's the point where I recognize that this thing does not have the correct screw pattern and there's no way they're going together. Okay, I've picked out two likely candidates for the neck and the middle position pickups. Um, checking to make sure that the um, fine copper leads are still intact. I notice on both of them that they've got uh, wires, insulation which is burned through by someone else's soldering iron. Multimeter over to the ohm scale. 20k ohms. Patch one probe to each lead. The uh, first one is coming up 6.92, 6.96. So they're a good match. I'll also do the same to the humbucker, which I note is pretty light and it just has one hot lead. This is vintage Gibson style. So there's not going to be a whole lot of customizing options in terms of switching. I'm just going to get kind of standard strat switching on this. This is a hot pickup. It's 15.45. Uh, Next thing. The pickup does not fit inside this route. Yeah, these are bigger than any of the standard sizes, so this thing was drilled out and probably mounted solid to something. Um, fantastic. Just for interest's sake, we'll see if these new knobs fit on these old alpha pots. And no, these are designed for American style CTS pots or something similar. So I guess we're going to rewire a pick guard. This is the bridge from a 1967 Fender Coronado II bass, which is a pretty groovy instrument. It's not here. I only have the bridge. I'm sorry. This thing used little plastic inserts for the saddles, and over time these have degenerated into something that is probably best described as black licorice. It's become soft and squidgy, it oozes around the um, string when it's at tension, which can't be great for the tone. But also it's been compressed or worn enough that the strings are now sitting too low and they're very close to the bridge pickup. I've been tasked with trying to make new inserts for it, so I picked up some of these Tusk Graftech to black nuts here. It's an appropriate color, it should do well. I wanted the extra large rectangular blanks with you know, no slotting or anything, but nobody seems to have them in stock at the moment, so I'm going to work with these. I should just be able to get a big enough blank out of them, I think. So I've taken some measurements, and now I have to cut and sand this stuff down to some pretty exacting tolerances, because these are a pretty snug fit in their little encapsulating cups. Thank <laughs> you. 
I made up a little custom radius sanding block by drilling through a piece of wood and sticking on some self-adhesive sandpaper. I'm using gauged nut files to do this. Start off with a thin one to mark the position and then I can use the thicker ones to get the correct half diameter. With these being more lightly slotted and also proud of the top surface by about a millimeter, unlike the original, there should be plenty of room for adjustment. That's all done. Let's go back to the Strat. These are not metal covers. They're plastic. And the plating on these is very weak. These are going to come off, you know, as soon as you play. So I have to be careful trying to install them that I'm not going to damage this very thin metallic plating. Just installing the switch here and I realize the top surface of this guard is not countersunk for these screws. I'll have to take that off again and do that. Okay. These holes in the guard were bored for the smaller diameter metric pots. So I have to enlarge those as well. I'm using a reamer here. It doesn't take much. I think I mentioned last week on that Telecaster the idea of just simply putting a new guard on. No. Never happened. I've got screw holes missing and some screw holes misaligned. So back to plugging and drilling. They're going for a hard return installation on this one. And you can see that I fixed the grounding wire to the actual claw rather than one of the fingers. Let's change out the tuners. Oh, but wait, different placement of the holes for the mounting pins in the back, so you can't just drop them in, no. Plug all of these, mark all of these, drill them all, then install them. So I plugged them all. Here I'm using a flush cut saw. And I'm aligning them. And I'm tightening the tuners just deep enough to give me some dimples so I'll know where to drill. It's time to make a tapered shim for the neck pocket, so I'll trace that out. I'll plane it and sand it. I have some holly veneer, which is very white, fine-grained wood, uh, which should work pretty well for this. I'll plane that to thickness and then glue it in place so there'll be a good snug fit. Not even close. <laughs> Plug them all. Maybe I'll keep the top right hand corner. Everything else has got to get plugged. Okay, now I'm switching around tuners. These are the staggered height kind, and ostensibly, you know, the tall ones go here and the short ones up here to, you know, give you better break angle. Of course, this model on this headstock, there is not enough clearance to actually get an E or an A string underneath the hole in the uh, the shaft there. So, because we have two sets of string trees, it really doesn't matter. I'm swapping the taller tuners for down here. Just because. Oh, I should show you that. So you put your 46 gauge string through there. Um, how does it go underneath itself? Ain't gonna happen. With the shim in the neck pocket now, the saddles are still bottomed out, but now the strings are resting right on top of the frets, which is pretty much where you want it to be. Okay, enough for tonight. It's one in the morning. I want to get this video edited, so I'm gonna be up to like 3.30. There are still a couple of things to do on this. I need to put a drop of paint on that shim, and the middle pickup base side screw is not responding to my requests. So I'll have to open that up and find that it's stripped out and figure out what I'm going to do to fix that. But it's playable. Like I said, a lot of work. 
This initially was framed as, I think it needs some neck work and a shim. And I've essentially now rebuilt the entire guitar. Parts casters. Not worth it. I mean, I can't blame this player. He doesn't know. You go online, it seems like plug and play. You pick the colors you want, put it all together, it's just like Lego. But it really isn't. These pickups here have different string spacing from the previous ones. They're wider. I, I actually think it's the 50s vintage, mm, what was it, 2 and 3 sixteenths bridge spacing. Eh, all the chrome is sparkly. It makes a statement. So I'll leave it up to you guys in the comments section. We'll do a poll. Having seen me put this thing together and realize that 20 minutes on screen is actually 5 hours plus time and then extra for the glue to dry, how much do you think this amount of fooling around is worth? What should someone pay to have a parts caster assembled in this manner? Mm -hmm.